The Growing Destinations podcast is brought to you by Experience Rochester. Learn more about Minnesota's third largest city, which is home to Mayo Clinic and features wonderful recreational and entertainment opportunities by visiting experiencerochestermn.com. For what we do at the end of the day, it's we're providing great experiences for people, whether that's live entertainment, whether that's a convention coming. And so it's been kind of fun to meet with the staff and say, like, how can we make this better? How can we, make, how can we have everyone excited to be in Duluth? Because not just because there's a cool, beautiful harbor out there, but because they know they're going to have that special touch when they arrive. What we really wanted to see and we really felt we were going to see after the, the main sort of closures of the pandemic subsided was a, a great reconnection among people. People just want to, you know, get together. There was a lot of talk, like, our meeting's going to be successful? Is live entertainment going to be successful? Are people ever going to get out again? And the answer is a resounding yes. Welcome to the Growing Destinations podcast, where we take a deep dive into destination development and focus on a wide range of topics, from tourism and entertainment to economic development and entrepreneurism, and much more. I'm your host, Bill Von Bank. Leaders from two of Minnesota's largest convention and event centers are seeing positive growth at their facilities. Joe Ward is president of Experience Rochester and the Mayo Civic Center. Dan Hartman is executive director of the Duluth Entertainment Convention Center, also known as The Deck. In a sit-down with me, they share results from 2022 and a look into the future. While competitors in the meeting and convention space, Joe and Dan acknowledge the important role of collaboration and learning from each other. Joe Ward, Dan Hartman, welcome to the Growing Destinations podcast. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be back. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. Joel, uh, you are back to the podcast. You actually helped kick this podcast off just about a year ago. So welcome back, and we look forward to having you on. Thank you. Somehow I got back, got invited again. I'm not really sure what I did, but I appreciate you uh, doing that. <laughs> well, we'll learn a lot about this past year, and uh, you can fill in some blanks from, from, from a year ago. Dan Hartman from the Duluth Entertainment Convention Center, Executive Director, Welcome. Glad to have you join us today. And we'd love to learn a little bit more about you and your career. My name is obviously Dan Hartman. I run the deck in Duluth, Minnesota. And for a lot of folks don't know is the deck's an interesting group. It actually has 10 venues. Wow. We have an outdoor amphitheater. We have a convention center. We have a symphony hall, but we also lease the space to the uh, movie theater of 10 theaters. We, and the weirdest of the 10 is we have an historic ore ship called the William A. Irvin. And so those, you know, there's a lot in that 10, but it's, it's an interesting role I have of kind of helping oversee all of those 10 different venues. I guess a little history on me. I think I'm an odd duck in the convention center world that my prior job was actually as an attraction with the Glenshine Mansion in Duluth, Minnesota. And I think how I ended up from there to here is a large part of what I did at Glenshine was to try to figure out what can we make the experience better at that as a touring site, not necessarily uh, there was a lot of focus on education but a lot of what we did was how can we make the visitor experience better how can we think about the visitor from the moment they pick up a rat card from the moment they get out of the car and leave and then when they're at home and they're still thinking about how do we can get them that thinking through that experience and also we just honestly had a lot of focus on the financials of just how can we turn this institution around and you know, I'm proud that in my time there, we took Glenching from 60,000 visitors a year to 120,000. And a top uh, historic site. And a top historic site. So, uh, you know, it had lost money every single year from 1981 to 2013. And now it's one of the most popular historic houses in, in, in Minnesota, period. Tell us how the transition's been for you going from a historic attraction to a large-scale event in Convention Center. Surprisingly similar. Um, I was expecting to have a lot more differences between the two, frankly. But there is, in any historic house or any historic museum, typically there's a lot of deferred maintenance. I didn't expect to have so much deferred maintenance <laughs> at the deck. And so, you know, a lot of my time right now is how can we get the facility that was built primarily in 1966 kind of up to a lot of everyone's standards from aesthetics to just general function. We have three ice plants, two of which are made between before 1980. So, I mean, there's just a lot of ongoing work that is needed at the deck that was needed at Glenching. And I would say, I can see a different scale, different scale, but you know, it wasn't until fairly recently that the staff number actually exceeded the staff I had at Glenching. And so I think a lot of times people forget how much it takes to run a lot of these attractions mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of what I'm doing right now, honestly, is getting the deck to really think of the experiential way that we did at Glenshine 
and to make sure that when people come for a convention, they have that same feeling of touch from the start of the beginning of their experience to the end. And for what we do at the end of the day, it's we're providing great experiences for people, whether that's live entertainment, whether that's a convention coming. And so it's been kind of fun to meet with the staff and say like, how can we make this better? How can we, how can we have everyone excited to be in Duluth? Because not just because there's a cool, beautiful Harbor out there, but because they know they're going to have that special touch when they arrive. And so I think that's the fun part. And it's very similar to the past. Joe, you came to Rochester, Minnesota in the summer of 2019, about six months in COVID hit and really changed the trajectory of, of the work you do. You're president of both Experience Rochester and the Mayo Civic Center, which is a dual role. So you lead the city's tourism promotion, and you also have oversight and management of the Mayo Civic Center. It's a unique model. How's it working? Well, it's working really well. I mean, it, uh, here's Dan mentioning he has 10 venues, and I thought we had a lot here to manage. And uh, <laughs> honestly, uh, I, I like the slimmed down version, if that's what you call us. But uh, <laughs> I think it's been working great. I know, obviously, as you mentioned, the pandemic came early on in my tenure. So there were definitely the inherent challenges that any meeting and group venue had uh, during that period. And, you know, I think during that period, we just really wanted to step up and be there for the community. And so we had, you know, lots of things here from a vaccine clinic uh, to distance learning center, you know, working with uh, area nonprofits and such in, in working with our homeless community to uh, make sure that there were housing opportunities for people during a challenging period. And so, uh, which actually, you know, was very different for us at the time, but really fulfilling on a personal level, because it's not something that I'd ever really been into. We, I always thought we were in the caring business, but we got to prove it then. And I think that that's where maybe Dan and I intersect a bit is you start thinking of how to really elevate people's experience, how to really care for those in the building. Uh, so it's really been nice to to see over the last now probably close to a year so many people coming back in the building for a variety of different things and also throughout the community on um, getting to celebrate. And of course, this time of year, just a wonderful time for people to get together. And it's glad, and I'm really glad that we're allowed to do so now a couple of years later and doing what we really do best. You both represent two large scale event and convention centers in Minnesota, Duluth, Rochester, Minneapolis. I think the top three, I'm not sure in which order, but they're, they're all big. So you have a lot of business to book. And you have competition, but also co-opetition among your facilities. Let's take a look back at 2022. How has business been at the Mayo Civic Center, Joe? Business here has just been picking up. I mean, started in early January with a large citywide conference. I believe we had over nine, 10 citywide conferences this year. We're heading into 2023 with 14 on the books. Uh, so really just moving forward, I think it's been great to see a steady increase and a steady incline. It's not, we're not like some of these uh, destinations around the country that are more known for their leisure travel, where they opened the doors and everybody just came and everybody made it the family vacation. We have a different experience here with the Mayo Clinic and such a, a medical community of people that come and visit, but as long associated conferences that our sales team and I've been able to to bring. And then of course our operations team has been able to deliver a top notch experience. So hopefully we get them back and, you know, people like my partner over here and crime, uh, Dan, <laughs> uh, don't steal them away to those great cities uh, up North. But uh, in all yeah. honesty, it is great to, to, as you said, co-opetition, you know, we're still partners in the state. And if people come to Minnesota, that's first and first and foremost in our mind. And not everybody wants to be in the same city every single year. So we want to embrace what the client needs, and sometimes they're going to want to be in Duluth, and sometimes they're going to want to be in Rochester, uh, and we want to make sure we can deliver that for the community more often than not. Dan, in terms of uh, business from 2022 for the DAC, give us a status report. We did not have a good kickoff of Q1. I mean, business was coming back, but we had only two cancelizations through the spring, but we had 50% attendance. And so that that was very painful for us. Because we, we make money on parking, we make money in catering. And so when people don't show up, it had a very negative effect on our financial situation. I was very happy to see that there was definitely a turn. So come in the well, midsummer, especially through the fall, it went ratcheted the complete opposite direction to the point that uh, we had an event when I was coming down to Rochester that would had 300 people more than we typically have at that event. So, I mean, so it's just, it's ratcheted very positively the other way. And so it's kind of ended up balancing the year out. But man, I will say that that first starter, whew, there was a lot of a lot of worries going around, and we are a leisure travel destination. But there were just legitimately still a lot of fear about like, should I go to this conference? And and I I applaud the conference uh, planners who still 
did those events and they struggled with those as well when they had half attendance. So there was, there was still a lot of struggle for up, up North a little bit. Was there a trend of short booking windows where pe- people would just book like oh, uh, yeah. within a month or a couple of months, just cause they just wanted to get back in person? Absolutely. Yep. Did you see that too? Yeah, Joe? we saw that here for sure. I mean, some of the ones that I mentioned is, uh, you know, the, the citywide conferences I was referring to, I think we booked three or four of those in a, six or eight month period, which is just unheard of in the meeting business. I mean, usually we're talking two years out, um, sometimes three. Uh, so to have those was like, okay, guess we're ready to go. And, you know, to Dan's point, we also did see some attendance drops, but you know, it kind of gets into the business dynamics can be different. So they have a parking facility where we don't. So we, we don't depend on that revenue. It uh, doesn't mean we don't depend on revenue, uh, just different types perhaps. So on-site yeah. attendance uh, can impact them on a daily basis and not necessarily as much here, uh, but, but glad to see, I mean, in Duluth, you know, what a great place to visit in the summer and in the spring. So, so good for them that they had that leisure kick it in and it's great to hear that they're getting and ramping up as well. Yeah. And I think to your competition part is, I think it's kind of fun that a lot of us do have different business models, but at the same time, there's a lot of overlapping things that we can learn from each other. And I'm a big believer that we all do better when we all do better. And I think the the competition sometimes will inspire each other to be like, hey, we can do this better. Like I'll say right now, I guess I'm inspired by the fact you guys are doing this. Like this is a cool podcast. And I've been the last couple of days, you as a community have, you just have such a great functional approach to how you handle tourism, that things are easy to get to. Your skywalk system, I think is actually really well laid out. And it's just been kind of fun to see from a hospitality lens how you, I, you're clearly thinking about the experience from start to finish. And Dan, we should mention that you're in Rochester on a benchmarking <laughs> trip with a few, yeah. a few of your uh, uh, board members and yeah. staffs. What are you learning? Because I think this isn't the first city you've done that it's with. Not, no. So this is the thing I took from my old job that I think the sometimes the best way to learn is not necessarily at a conference. No offense to us who put conferences on. Um, but sometimes it's just to go to these places who do other things well and learn from each other. And, you know, I, I, I really don't believe there's any, any true original idea. And so it's just good to learn from each other. Yeah. I did share with him that the only payment for the visit is that he has to turn over his notes of all the visits. So but, <laughs> but I look forward to seeing those when it's all done. And we yeah, can all yeah, be back. Yeah. But I do wish at some point to have you guys come up North too. It'd be kind of fun. So, yeah. We would absolutely love to really for a hockey game, especially for you. Yeah, well, it's true. I am a hockey fan. So <laughs> Duluth, I'm all about it. Yeah. You talk a lot about meetings and conventions, but both, both, both your venues also cater to live entertainment. Tell us how 2022 has been for live events coming back and uh, how the people are reacting to that. What we really wanted to see and we really felt we were going to see after the, the main sort of closures of the pandemic subsided was a, a great reconnection among people. People yeah. just want to you know, get together. There was a lot of talk like, our meeting's going to be successful is live entertainment going to be successful? Are people ever going to get out again? And the answer is a resounding yes. Absolutely, it's been wonderful. Uh, in particular, and I think this uh, Dan may back this up as well, comedy seems to be the entertainment of the year that everybody Absolutely. wants to get out. Probably doesn't, not much of a surprise after such a stressful couple of years. People just, you know, they want to laugh and they want to enjoy themselves. So Yeah, comedy's been a hit. If there was a star of live entertainment in 2022, it was comedy. And I just... I think for us, once again, having kind of that rough spring, we really put a lot more effort into live entertainment this last year. It's kind of a way, frankly, to diversify our portfolio a little bit too. And, and to, as you said, man, the audience, they showed up this year. And so it's, it's been a year for live entertainment, absolutely. And I'm excited to see what happens even more as time progresses. Yeah, and I would say that that's also an area where we intersect as destinations. When we, again, we use that term, co-opetition. Yeah. You'll probably hear it five more times, but because we've shared some of the same acts. We didn't know that really at the time, but now that we're really looking at how the calendar, Tom Segura, I know, was in both. We had other comics that were up there, other entertainers, Sticks, I believe they had, were about to have. Joe Gatto uh, coming, yeah. Realizing, the uh, Joe Gatto, realizing that there's a way, because of the distance, like a healthy distance to Duluth, that we can uh, really cooperate and maybe share with promoters to get them routed. Uh, so that way guests come to both cities, you know, a little far enough apart that uh, you're not going to have anybody from Rochester drive up to Duluth specifically for that act, unless it's the summer and they want a beer along the, along the waterfront there. But again, and you're not going to have that vice versa. So that I think is one area that we can really probably build on together. And generally you serve different markets for the live entertainment. For sure. And I will add into that too. I mean, a lot of times what we're doing is really trying to get the attention of these promoters and try to treat them right. So if we can join up together and treat them as a whole, that's going to help be a better self, frankly, for Minnesota as a whole. 
your venues are both unique in that you cater to meetings and conventions, as we talked about, as well as live entertainment. Does that make it more challenging to manage your facilities when you have competing interests? I think for us, it can. But in the end, like our, our team here knows, you know, we're here to serve the guest who comes through the door. I mean, the dynamics of who that is and how that event looks are certainly different because, you know, live entertainment, you're lo- more likely to have a local visitor, to have somebody just in the community, you know, here to enjoy themselves as well as a visitor coming in from a different area. As far as the management of it, each one, you know, you may have for a comic, you need a, a stool on a stage, uh, whereas a conference, you need some of the highest, you know, AV quality that you, that you have. So staff levels can change, you know, and sometimes you'll have a situation where, you know, space is in demand and so you have to work about work timing of booking. So maybe shorter windows are booked for live entertainment, whereas the longer windows are for meetings and conventions. But we can also try to book a show that we can intersect with a great conference, which I think is an opportunity that we have here that a lot of facilities don't have because we we manage that. And so if we land a conference, we can also work with them and say, hey, what kind of music does your uh, your team, your group enjoy and do our best to try to have something. Uh, so maybe some of those folks come a day early or stay a day later to enjoy some of that live entertainment. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think sometimes not only is it a challenge, it's, it's downright humorous how these things intersect. And, I, you know, I, we have bulldog hockey and the student section enters a certain way in the building. And where they enter is also where the symphony hall guests get together. So if you can picture a symphony audience and a line of, we'll say, uh, well-influenced 20-year-olds getting ready to go into a hockey game. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting intersection of people that we try to manage at times. But it's, it's, it is definitely a challenge, but I think it's one of the fun parts of the gig is watching how that intersects. I think you guys just had a wrestling event over the weekend, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if you had another event that was very different from that audience. And I think that's part of the fun. Well, wrestling was our through line. So we had the the amateur wrestling uh, on Saturday, and then on Sunday we had WWE in the building. Yeah. And so I, I say the pros in quotes uh, that more of the entertainment side of wrestling on Sunday. Uh, but yeah, we always have a diverse uh, you know yeah. group. And as far as you know, Duluth goes, you certainly don't want to get in the way of uh, Minnesota hockey. So no. uh, you have to make sure that they're taken care of. And I and I would believe those college students are are well prepared for the game. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say one of the things I was really excited about visiting Rochester is you're one of the few facilities in Minnesota who have so much of a variety in, in different facilities. And I think that is one of our unique challenges that our two sites really have that others don't have is all these different venues that we have, we get to manage. Yeah, and we went through that like a transition three years ago to where we took on that responsibility. And so when Dan was mentioning how he was in a former attraction and then now has taken all this on, and was kind of surprised how similar it is. I mean, one of our challenges in the very beginning were finding team members, leadership roles of people who had experience in, let's say, a, a combined venue because there's so very few of them. So you, we would either sort of have a, a live entertainment theater person or a convention person. And and now I believe you know some of our team members here are some of the most trained, most prepared people to you know, go out into the industry if they would choose at some time too and run any type of facility. And I think that that's a great reason why hopefully people would like to work with us, but also, you know, it's just something that we should be proud of that it's not typical and it is not easy. You know, bringing events to your communities doesn't just benefit your venues. Let's talk about the community economic impact of the work you both do, because sometimes it's considered fun more than economic impact. And that's the rub tourism and the meeting and convention business gets is that people don't always recognize it for, for the benefit it has for the community. So let's talk about Joe, for example, when you hosted last January, a citywide convention, which is somewhat unheard of in the first week of January, but I bet the hospitality community was feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, I would certainly would hope so, and I think that they were. I mean, we saw guests from the Mayo Civic Center out into the community from at you know different restaurants buying from our retailers. It's time that they just really needed it. They were just getting back after so many COVID closures, or, you know, removed people from the community, and so this brought people back. You know, it's it's just great to see. I mean, we can we can get out there and say that the return is a gazillion dollars or whatever number that we want to say, <laughs> uh, but the reality is when you see you know lines in a restaurant or you see 
a store or get an email from a restaurateur, which I know we, we had a couple last winter. They're really motivating because they talk about the impact on their business and on their team members, you know, and I think, you know, let's just say, let's hope that a server in a restaurant maybe could have uh, bought that TV they've been trying to budget for and didn't quite, you know, so when the extra crowd came in January, they had the money to do so. And those types of things work throughout the community. And we just want to bring more and more of that as time goes on. Dan, I mean, Duluth in and of itself is such a major tourism town, nature based, but uh, you add the impact of the DAC and, and it's obviously felt around the community. Yeah. And I think that's, especially coming out of the pandemic, where a lot of businesses were, were struggling. And for me, one of my moments that I really got to kind of get a, a sense of purpose in the job is sometimes when I, I'll walk across the skywalk and I get my hair cut in the skywalk. And the woman, she's like, she's like, you guys must, you guys must have conventions coming back. I'm like, wow. She's like, because I see the business. Like, I'm actually getting new business day to day. And and then as you walk around, you see Subway and Subway's lines out the door because people are here for convention. You know, you go and talk to the restaurants in Canal Park and they're like, they, they'll come to me like, oh, Dan, thank you for bringing this business. You know, like it's, it's, it's a real thing. And I think that's if there's differences between my old role and this role is Glenshin's kind of like in the going up the North Shore. And I don't see the direct impact that it has in the community. I know it does. But at the deck, you literally just walk out the door and you can see how it's helping people all all around. And I'm, I know you have to see that same experience, especially in these citywide conferences. And so, yeah, we bring cool stuff. Our job is to do cool things. But at the same time, it has a really positive reward for so many people. And that's a, just a very intrinsically rewarding thing. Yeah, and by the nature of what we do, it's supposed to be the, the yeah. fun business. We're not supposed to show everybody how the sausage was made, right? So it's easy to say, oh, like uh-huh. you said, Bill, you know, it's easy to say, well, that's the fun department. That's the, but we're, we're assigned to be the always Saturday, always sunny department. And I think that's the part is put our best foot forward for the mm-hmm. community. But I you do want people to know out there that you know, how much people really work to put these things on and how much time they dedicate and the passion that they dedicate to this work. And we're really thankful to have them because in this, t- you know, especially now, a lot of our folks could work in a lot of different places and they choose to work here and they choose to deliver for the community and I know, yes, they get a paycheck, but I also know that even our team members here that one might say, well, they're just early in their career, they're collecting a paycheck. They feel it, they see it. You can tell those that are going to be in this industry a long time because they're, they wear their heart on their sleeve and their passion's there for everybody that comes through this door and for everybody that comes to Rochester. Let's take a look at 2023 and what's the trend line look like for, for your venues? Well, we're, we're having another good kickoff. I would say, you know, again, we have 14 citywides on the books for us for this year. Our live entertainment calendar is about, you know, right now shaping up to be about what it was last year, which is solid. Rochester, since the, the early days of the pandemic, where our hotel occupancy went down to, you know, 15% uh, for a couple months, that's just been a slow and steady incline. Uh, also has to do some with the Mayo Clinic, which of course brings you know just millions of visitors to the community every year as they've kind of taken on more patients and they've also reached out further and getting back to sort of, if you call it business as normal, we've again seen more and more of those people, but it's been more steady incline instead of a, a huge spike. And I think that that's probably also uh, better as some hotels and some people still you know, hospitality community, probably in both of our respective communities, still struggle to find some of those uh, those employees at the moment and people to take care of those. So I was just really glad that, again, the, the incline is there. And of course, now I look at the headlines every time I see a new a new virus or a new this or that. <laughs> and I, I do get a little PTSD, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm excited for 2023. Dan? No, I, I laugh at that last comment. That is so, so real of just reading the paper headline every day and being aware. But that being said, I think conventions, I think, are in a, slop, a slow uptick for sure going into next year. I'm very happy to see that. It's gonna, we're probably going to have a slightly better year than the prior. But on the live entertainment side, and I would say on the leisure travel side, you kind of alluded to it multiple times, but we are very fortunate to be in a nature-based position where leisure travel has been phenomenal. So right now, I think Duluth tourism tax is up 15.1% over the prior year, which is one of also the wow. better years we've had. So, I mean, on the marketing front as a community, man, it is, it is kicking butt right now. And, and so one of the things that we are challenging ourselves are is how can we adapt to that leisure travel market as well? Because summer is actually a slow season for us on the convention side. 
And so we're probably going to do more leisure travel activities and more immersive experience exhibits. So for example, I know you guys had it too. The Jurassic Quest exhibit did really well. And so we want to do more things like that. And so we'll probably get more into that game in the summer so we can kind of match that leisure travel and be a supplement to that industry that is just rocking and rolling in July. What excites you both about the work you do, Joe? Well, for me, it's really seeing the guest, you know, the guest that's enjoying their, their experience that's coming to a new community or just getting out in their own community and seeing something different, you know, whether it's a child coming for the Harlem Globetrotters or a Jurassic Quest up to a doctor coming to, you know, learn more about their field in, in, you know, in, in Rochester at a conference. And I think when you have the Mayo Clinic doctors, they're the, they're the best in the world at what they do. So it's great to see when they come in here, spend some time and really focus on what they do best and making them even better. And you still, you feel that connection to something bigger and something uh, more fulfilling beyond that. I mean, during the pandemic, it was extremely helpful and motivating to me to see just some of the things that we were able to do because of, you know, being a large facility and a group that knows how to put events together for large groups of people to help when it came to the vaccinations or to the distance learning center, that was extremely fulfilling and something you know, kind of new to me, as I said earlier, and uh, for me going into the, you know, the future of my career is never lose sight of that aspect and the, the empathy that I think now all of us have for others and for the community around us. Dan, how about you? What excites you about the work you do? It's we, we bring people together. We help people be happy here in their day-to-day lives. We help them be better at their careers. And it's, we get to witness that all the time. And that's a really kind of awesome experience. And that's the uh, nice way to say it, but like, man, nothing makes me happier than walking into a sold out Amsoil show. You know, like when you have that crowd roll and when you have everyone, when you have the bar lines full and everyone's thinking, like, it's, it's harder to be happier than that moment. We had 9,000 people for our Trample by Turtle show in the Bayfront Park and we manage that facility and we don't make a lot of money from it, but it's hard not to put a smile on my face when you see 9,000 people just and having a good time. And I go back to what I said earlier too, like we're helping. Like we are legit, seriously helping our communities and on the day to day work we do. And I, I'm an old city councilor when I was younger in my twenties, and I would easily say that I'm doing more good for the community in this role today than I ever did as a city councilor. And I think that's what I think is great about our job. Well, you both are great. You do great work for yeah. your communities. I really appreciate your time today on Growing Destinations, and best of luck in yeah. 2023 to all of us. This is gonna be fun next year. Yeah. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Dan, and looking forward to getting up to Duluth this summer and uh, going to make them return and see some, uh, you know, for a conference in the tourism community or something down here. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you for tuning in to the Growing Destinations podcast, and don't forget to subscribe. This podcast is brought to you by Experience Rochester. Find out more about Rochester, Minnesota, and its growing arts and culture scene, its international culinary flavors, and award-winning craft beer by visiting experiencerochestermn.com.